Well, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome in from around North America and beyond. My name is Jesse. I'm here with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. And I know we've got some familiar faces in the crowd today, but we've got some new classes joining us too. So welcome in. We are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. And you have chosen a really epic month to begin with us because even though we do like 50 broadcasts every single month, this month is really special because February is our entire month solely dedicated to the most kick-ass, amazing women in science on planet Earth. We've got cave divers. We've got astrophysicists. We've got engineers and more. It is so much fun. You can check it all out on our website. And everything we do goes to our YouTube channel. So if you want to check out this program or anything else that we've got on the go, you can head there and do just that anytime you'd like. I do want to do a special plug too for our If Then series. We're partnering with one of the greatest women's science organizations in the world ever for a 16-part broadcast series next week, and it's all at that channel. So do check that out when you're done. Lots to explore and discover. Now, I like to bring the coolest stories, different stories all the time to kids like you because there's so much going on in the world. But every now and then we have a scientist come on who's so amazing that we've got to just bring her back all the time. So May has like a long standing anytime she wants to come, we just bring her back. And today she's going to talk about her amazing research, finding out really cool things about really weird and elusive animals in a really unique way. You might know this already from signing up before or with your teachers, but I don't want to steal her thunder. I'm going to turn it over to you, her to blow your mind over the next 20 minutes with the amazing work she's done um, in Madagascar and beyond. So May, thank you so much. Welcome to the broadcast again and take us away. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. So uh, let me just go ahead and get my thing playing. There we go. Looks good. It looks amazing. Couldn't okay. be better. Okay. All right. So yes, thank you for having me back, Jesse. Thank you to all the classrooms who've tuned in. I'm going to be telling you a bit about my expedition to the Buru Protected Area, aka the Lost Forest and my research, which involves heavily uh, blood-sucking leeches. Now, before we can get into the leeches, first I wanna talk about biodiversity. Now, biodiversity is simply the variety of all life on Earth. And this variety itself helps maintain crucial services like maintaining clean air and fresh water, regulating climate and buffering the spread of infectious disease. It is also a source of many medicines and pharmaceuticals, and it also just helps us feel better. Everyone feels better after they go outside or they see a bird, um, for example. And so, unfortunately, scientists agree that all over the world, most biodiversity is decreasing. <clears throat> And so in order to be able to track this biodiversity that is decreasing and monitor it over time, researchers normally conduct surveys, biodiversity surveys, um, to keep track of what is still out there. And so normally that's done with traditional methods like going out and looking for animals yourself um, or using some technology like this camera trap which is a camera that's fastened to a tree and it's got a sensor that's triggered to take a picture anytime anything walks in front of it, or by trapping small animals, small mammals particularly. Um, so this involves setting out a trap, baiting it with some banana and being really patient and hoping that someone takes the bait like this mouse lemur. And of course this is done with just an incredible amount of logistics and planning and permits. So all of these survey methods require a lot of permissions. They're typically very um, costly and involved, and especially in the case of trapping, they can be very stressful for the little animals. Now, researchers have also started using leeches um, to try to survey biodiversity. So what you see here is a land leech or a terrestrial leech. Um, and we can slice open the gut contents uh, of these blood sucking worms and extract DNA from their blood meals and reveal the different animals that they were feeding on based on that DNA. And so using this technique, I've been able to find all these different animals 
found in the forests of Madagascar. Um, and so now we know that leeches are really good at picking up the DNA of everything from snakes to birds to mammals and sometimes even some fish. So they're, they're really good at feeding on a wide range of animals. And I did just wanna show you what a leech in action looks like. So this is in the field, a leech crawling around on my backpack in Madagascar. And you'll notice they move much like a little inchworm. They sort of loop and then stretch and loop and stretch. And they're very small. They're only a few, a few millimeters in length. As you can see here, my backpack for scale. And they just wander around the forest like this looking for hosts to feed on. Um, and they're a really great way to monitor biodiversity because where they are found, they are very abundant. There's always a ton of them in the forest and they're usually out there collecting you before you can collect them. Um, so they're attracted to movement. Um, and as you're walking through the forest, they're always you know, alert and more likely than not, crawling towards you before you realize it. Um, and these leeches, they're very particular. Again, they are terrestrial leeches or land leeches. They're found across several tropical rainforests in the Indo-Pacific region. So that's everywhere from Australia through um, the rainforests of Indonesia um, and Malaysia, up through Southern China, India, and Madagascar. Now, Madagascar is right here. Um, it is the world's fourth largest island. It's off the southeast coast of Africa. And it's a special place. Much of the original rainforest has been lost. Most of the species there are found nowhere else. Um, they're endemic, which, which means that they're found nowhere else. And the majority of these species are unfortunately relying on this constantly shrinking habitat. So there is sort of a very urgent biodiversity crisis happening in Madagascar. And within Madagascar, there are, you know, there's still rainforest around, um, but it all needs monitoring. And so I was invited to join this expedition um, to this little forest fragment, the Iwohiburu Protected Area or the Lost Forest. Um, and this is what it looks like sort of on the map. It's got sort of a Northern fragment and a Southern fragment. Um, and it, it is just, it, it's a beautiful place, but it is shrinking much like most of Madagascar's forests. Um, and then getting to this forest is actually a little bit involved. So when you travel to Madagascar, um, you arrive in the capital of, an, of Antananarivu, and then you have to journey south um, to Ranamafan, uh, another small research station in the south. And then we have to make a trip out to this little town called Ihusi to make sure that all of our papers in check and we have all our permits and that we're ready to go. And then we finally make it out to the little forest. So all in all, this is on average a four day journey just to get to the start of the trailhead. Um, and so as we approach the forest, you can start to see that along the horizon, there isn't much moisture. And you'll notice that this mountain sort of has, it, it's, it's bowl shaped, right? And so the forest itself is sitting at the base of this bowl, that's the lost forest. Um, and you'll notice that across the horizon, the only place where clouds and moisture uh, are retained and are forming are over this forest. And so this really illustrates a pattern that we see in nature where forests are really one of the primary sources of fresh water. Um, forests are constantly releasing water um, from their leaves and producing condensation, which then forms clouds that rain down on the forest again. So they're really critical parts of the water cycle. And so when you remove forests, you often almost always remove fresh water. Um, so this just goes to show you how crucial these little forests are no matter how small um, and no matter how scattered they may be. And so after we've traveled for four days to get to this trailhead, we're finally able to start hiking up to the Lost Forest. 
And for the majority of the hike, this is what we're looking at. It is barren, it's rocky, it's dry. Um, this was a particularly cloudy day, but when the clouds aren't around, the sun is beating down on you and it's a four hour uphill hike in these conditions. It really feels like you're sort of walking on the surface of Mars. And then suddenly you start to hear the forest before you see it. Um, you hear the birds and that's, that's always a moment that stays with me is when you've been hiking for four hours and you're exhausted and you're thirsty and you're sweaty. Um, and finally, finally, after what feels like an eternity, you start to hear the forest. Um, it's, it really makes it all worth it because a forest is really the last thing you expect to see in that landscape. And this is what you see once you come over that final saddle. I mean, it is really breathtaking um, just to see all of this green suddenly spill over and appear out of, out of what feels like nowhere. And so I was part of a really big expedition uh, pretty recently in uh, November of 2023. We were out there with about 75 people this is only part of our team. We've got about 60 people in this photo. Now, all of these people are highly trained researchers. They have trained all their lives to find various different types of animals. So we've got lemur specialists, frog specialists, bird specialists, you name it, people who study spiders, people who study ants. Um, and so we were all working together to try to document as much biodiversity as we could. And I wanted to give you a little taste of what life was like at camp. So we were camped at the top of a mountain, essentially. And so all of our camp was on a slope um, and it was all up in those clouds that you saw, which meant that it was always rainy um, and nothing was really ever dry, which meant that a lot of our clothes got really moldy and stinky um, and everyone was pretty much cold and wet the whole time. But obviously there's no running water aside from the little stream that runs through the camp. So this was how uh, I washed my hair because I was out there for three and a half weeks. Um, and we would all gather around a central tarp to eat our meals together um, in the morning, in the evening. Uh, so it was it was a fun time, it, fun in its own way, you know. And so here I also just wanted to show you our little camp. Um, right along that tree line and those clouds that are constantly just moving through. Um, now, my job as part of the expedition was to document this biodiversity using terrestrial leeches, using land leeches. Um, and as I said before, it's often very easy to collect leeches um, because all you have to do is go hiking through the rainforest really slowly. And you sort of are always assessing the situation. You're constantly checking your boots, your pants, your jacket to see whether or not there are leeches approaching um, or whether there are leeches that are sort of climbing all over you. And you pick them off and stick them in these little baggies. Now, we do not want to collect any leeches that have fed on any humans. So if any leech has fed on me or a member of my team, we let it be because that'll flood the leech with human DNA, which we aren't really interested in learning about. And then we take these leeches back to camp where I sort them out into different groups to help me analyze them later on. And I just wanted to give you a little taste for what working in this forest was like. I love invertebrates. I love, you know, um, arachnids and insects and, and things without a backbone. So um, I'm always really excited to find uh, little buggy things in the forest. <clears throat> so these were probably my favorites. Um, we've got a rainbow, uh, rainbow milkweed locust all the way on the left here and these really bright sort of alarming colors. And this is a warning sign to predators not to eat this locust because it is poisonous. And then we've got this huge gnarly cricket with those mandibles, which is just so cool. I want this printed out in a poster in my home. Um, and we've got the classic golden orb weave spider, 
that spins this beautiful golden silk, which is among one of the strongest materials on the planet. And um, the spider is roughly the size of your hand, so they can get pretty big, but they are harmless. Um, and if anything, they're just they're just nice to look at. Of course, we also have lemurs. You can find lemurs only in the forests of Madagascar. They're found nowhere else in the world, which again makes them very endangered by nature. And we were really excited to find this particular mouse lemur in the forest, which we believe might be a new species of lemur altogether. We also have, of course, the very famous ring-tailed lemurs um, are found in this forest. They're usually not found in rainforests. They're usually found in a very um, arid desert-like forest out in the uh, Western region of Madagascar. So it was really strange to find them all the way out here, um, sort of in the central region of Madagascar, living in a rainy rainforest. So we're not really sure why they've done that, how long they've been in this forest, whether or not they're even closely related to the populations of ring-tailed lemurs in the West, um, whether they have new adaptations to this little forest to help them survive, so there are a ton of mysteries surrounding not just the lemurs, but really everything that we've found um, in the Lost Rainforest. <clears throat> we always find chameleons. Um, Madagascar has the highest concentration of chameleon diversity in the world. So you'll find big and small chameleons, you know, the length of your forearm down to itty bitty chameleons that are no bigger than about a fingernail. Um, and uh, they are, you know, come in all different shapes and sizes. You also have the satanic leaf-tailed gecko, which again is also only found in Madagascar. And these are really impossible to spot um, in the field. They are incredibly well camouflaged. They've got a tail that looks like a, a, a dead leaf um, and they can change colors depending on where they're standing. I mean, they are just so cool. And here we have some dwarf lemurs, which again, I just wanna just want to reiterate that anytime you see any animal being handled, it's because we have so much paperwork um, and approval to be able to do that. And so the only people who are handling them are highly trained specialists. This is a dwarf lemur that we trapped um, on one of our trapping nights, which we believe is a new species. You see here on the right, it's got that little white tuft at the end of its tail. That's not something that you normally see across other dwarf lemur species throughout Madagascar. So again, very exciting. And a ton of frogs, frogs that we didn't really expect to find, again, way out in this little lost forest. Um, a lot of rainforest frogs, but, but a lot of species of frogs that are probably going to require an update to their um, natural distribution in the wild. So uh, scientists are probably going to have to sort of update the, the databases that describe where different species are found. Um, and these frogs are going to need a little, a little update in that sense. And so once I've collected my leeches, I collected here 1,451. Um, I package them into these little tubes and I fill them with fluid that preserves DNA. And I wrap them up really well so that they don't leak on my flight. And, uh, and then I issue exportation permits to get them out of Madagascar. And Fish and Wildlife will usually meet me at the airport in the US and check to see that I have my permits. And I always have my permits and so it's no problem, but that's sort of how the leeches get from the forest to the lab. Um, and so once they're in the lab, they undergo this dissection. Uh, and so I individually dissect every single leech in this manner, which takes a very long time. This video is extremely sped up. Um, and dissecting them in this way makes sure that I am excluding as much leech tissue as possible and really just targeting as much blood meal content as I can. And so we remove that, um, the caudal sucker, the back end sucker of the leech, because that's going to be all leech DNA. And then we go in for the host blood meal DNA in this little piece. 
And these are the results that we get. These are some of my top quality results of leech gut contents. Um, after some pipetting in the lab, we are able to get this sort of data. Um, and so here we can, we can show that leeches have fed on everything from this little falcon to ring-tailed lemurs to tenrex and birds. Um, and I always like to point out that even with that enormous team that we were working with in the field of 75 experts who have all been trained all their lives to detect various different animals, with leeches, I was able to find these four frogs that were not picked up by those specialists. Um, and so that's not to say that those specialists didn't do a good job, but of course there is always more to learn when we use new and different methods. And so surveying leeches for biodiversity seems to be very efficient because they will pick up on animals that are normally too small to trigger camera traps, to camouflage, to spot even with a trained eye. And so they really offer up a unique and a new slice of the ecosystem that tends to go unnoticed in these large scale surveys. So I always advocate for including a leech survey um, in a biodiversity monitoring program if you're going to be working in any of those forests across that Indo-Pacific region which harbors terrestrial or land leeches. And so with that, I will stop here um, and I'll be happy to take some questions. <laughs> <laughs> what a hilarious final picture with a leech on the face. I appreciate that very much, May. Um, well, thank you so much. Madagascar is such a special place, even by the incredible standards of the, the places that we showcase in these broadcasts, some of the most biodiverse places on planet Earth. Madagascar is really special because it has so many unique creatures and gigantic, wonderful spiders, which you and I agree are beautiful, but I think a lot of our students might disagree. We'll see if we get <laughs> questions on that in the Q&A. Um, classes, we are going to dive in with Q&A. May, I don't know if you can see us right now, but feel free to exit screen share if you can't. This is nice to uh, see the kids. Yeah. Um, okay, there we go. I can see you now. There you are. We're going to head to our Hill Park Learning Crew first for a question in just a second. I do want to note our YouTubers, if you guys want to chime in with questions, we'd love to hear from you too. Uh, but we'll begin with Hamilton. If you guys want to kick us off and go with a question for May, you are in the broadcast and good to go. Hi, guys. <laughs> Hill Park. Hey, folks. Hello. Hello, no, no hurry. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Hello. Thank you for the presentation. That was wonderful. Did you like it, guys? Oh, yeah. I like it. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. I, I was interested. Thank you, Sierra. <laughs> Do you have any questions for me? Any questions, guys? Uh, I have a question. Sam has a question. Sam, can you yeah. come here and ask? Um. How often do you find that the leeches are like already on you? Um, almost always, <laughs> almost always while we're collecting, um, there'll be a couple of leeches that we can't collect because they've made it through our many layers of clothing and have latched and um, yeah, are just no good. So, I mean, it, it happens pretty often. <laughs> These are the moments I'm glad I live in Newfoundland. Um, <laughs> for Kansas class, we're going to head to Irving, Texas. If you guys have one for us, come on in. And then Ms. Wangs, you are coming to you next. And we'll do a few rounds of these. So stay near the computer, folks. Uh, Mr. Kantz. Hi, third graders. Hi. Oh, go ahead. Ask your question. All right. Um, does, does it hurt when the lemur sucks your blood? Does it Stop hurt? The leech. Does it hurt? Yeah. When the leech sucks your blood, May. <laughs> no, no, it doesn't hurt at all. I mean, it, it really just feels, I mean, you don't feel a mosquito when it bites you and it's sort of the same thing. So um, I always like to say though, in the rainforest, you're working where it's always raining. Um, and these leeches are cold to the touch and they're pretty small. Um, and so when you're hiking through the rainforest, it's kind of a, an interesting game to try to figure out you know, is it raining or is there a leech that's fallen down on me from above or is it my own blood that I feel trickling down my leg? Um, could be any, could be anything, you know? <laughs> um, so yeah, it, it, 
usually it's totally painless. Um, and if you feel it at all, you'll just feel like uh, a little cold, slimy thing. Um, and uh, there's no pain. You're selling this beautifully. The cold, slimy thing, the blood trickling <laughs> down. Like, yeah. for students that are new to this, this is not what they're usually like. I'm very excited that I you ready for your first program. Um, Miss Fancy's class, Oregon, Ohio. Hi, guys. Welcome in. Fourth graders. Hello. Yeah, go ahead. How much blood do leeches suck in a day? In a day. So leeches, well, you saw how big they are. They're just, you know, a couple millimeters in length. They're not huge, but they can actually feed seven times their own weight in blood. Um, now, that's not a huge volume of blood, but that's pretty big considering how small they are. So, you know, looking at a leech that hasn't fed versus a leech that's fully engorged, I mean, they can get to be about the width of my finger when they're fully engorged. Um, so they can do seven times their own weight, seven times their own weight in blood. So if you kids are like 80 pounds, let's just say that's like, I'm really 560 pounds. You'd eat, do you eat like a hundred turkeys? Imagine that Thanksgiving, really hardcore. Uh, <laughs> really great. I, I didn't know that. Thank you, man. Yeah. And um, so, but, but they don't have to feed, they don't feed every day so they can go many months, up to six months without feeding again. And so- Kind of fun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that two days a year that you just gorge yourself and then you just like yeah. sit around and like go along the forest canopy and you know, have cappuccinos and whatever. Um, mm -hmm. Great questions, guys. All right, uh, YouTubers, if you want to chime in, please do, we'd love to hear from you. Um, but Mr. Kansas class, we're gonna head back to you guys. If you have another one for us, come on in. Hey. Uh, Here. Uh, be clear about your question. What do you guys eat? He wants to know what you eat when you're in that camp. Oh, right. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, we're very grateful to be at camp with a whole team of cooks. And so while we're out doing our research and collecting data, we have a team that's constantly preparing food for us. Um, and so for breakfast, we usually get eggs with rice. Um, and something you should know about Madagascar is every meal comes with rice. So you get um, eggs and rice for breakfast, and then you get rice and beans for lunch. And then for dinner, uh, we usually come into the field with a lot more protein than we end up leaving with, obviously. So at the start of the expedition, we'll probably have like chicken and beef with rice. Um, and then towards the end of the expedition, when our food starts running a little low, it might look like pasta with rice. <laughs> um, so it's it's usually rice and beans pretty reliably. Um, and then, yeah, if if we're lucky, if we have the resources to manage it, either chicken or beef um, and eggs are also a, a nice treat in the field. The nice thing with uh, all the field diets, because I've heard this sort of thing before with these exact foods, is that that's basically what I ate until I was like 25. Like, that's it. <laughs> yeah. The rice, the pasta, it makes it very exciting. So I can go in for the world. Be ready. <laughs> um, we're going to head back to our Jerusalem Elementary Focus with Swank Juice class. Unmute your mic, come on back in, and uh, take us away. Hey, guys. How many leeches have you found? So I have collected. 1,451 leeches um, during my expedition, but I have also found two new species of leech that have not yet been known to science before. Um, so, and, and I mean, this is just because people don't really study leeches, right? I mean, every time you go out into the field, you're almost always likely to find something new. Um, and that's also the case with Madagascar. So working in Madagascar and working on leeches, two um, very rich in biodiversity systems allows you to sort of make these types of discoveries. And so we have a, a new species of leech from the Lost Forest, and we also have a new species of leech from uh, a different national park uh, in Madagascar. Very cool. I'm so curious what you named them after because classically when people find new species and whenever people go to the deep sea or rainforest of any kind, they find new species, which is amazing. Mm -hmm. but you're basically not allowed to name them after yourself. I think you could, but like no one's ever done that because it's too much. So yes. Did you get to pick the names and what did you name them after? Yeah. So I worked with a team 
to 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 come up with a name for the one that we found in Bronomofon National Park. So that's just a bit north of the Lost Forest. Um, and because this leech was found only in one particular field site within the national park, um, the field site of Mangevu, right next to the village of Mangevu, uh, we decided we would call it um, Catanabdella, which is the genus name, Mangevuensis, which is the, the species name. So Catanabdella Mangevuensis is the name of the new leech from Ron Mofan. Very nice. How cool is yeah. that? <laughs> um, I've got one online, and then we're going to do another round with our classes before we wrap up together. Um, are there any rare species of animal that you've learned more about or found <laughs> out about through the blood that you've taken from leeches? Like anything that you otherwise would have a really hard time finding? Yeah, I mean, I mean these, these ring-tailed lemurs, as I was saying before, um, we had only heard rumors that they were found in this lost forest. Um, and on one day, we thought we heard their calls really far off, but we tried our best to go find them and we couldn't. Um, and so to have their DNA in leeches is really exciting because this really places them in this forest, which again, was a very strange finding um, and is very unusual for this species of lemur. And so by discovering their DNA within a leech, we can now start to ask bigger questions about, well, how did they get there and how long have they been there and how similar are they to other populations of ring-tailed lemurs? Um, so that kind of thing. Um, it's my dream to see an eye in the wild. I have not ever seen an eye in the wild. Um, and I always dream and hope to to find uh, some eye DNA within a leech, but that hasn't yet happened. So. <laughs> I really encourage our classes to look up II. They are one of the freakiest, most wonderful animals on planet Earth. Our friends at the Duke Lemur Center, who we have on all the time to talk about lemurs, have some amazing IIs, uh, but they're unlike anything on Earth. They're like a, the candidate for the most alien looking mammal that there is, I think. Um, totally. So, and only the, found in Madagascar. Only found in Madagascar, like all lemurs, yes? Yes. No lemurs, yes. yes. Yeah, good. Yes. I've crossed over to Mozambique or anything. Um, mm -hmm. We're going to do one more round of questions, folks, and then wrap up from there. Uh, Mr. Kansas class, come on back in third graders and take us away. Hey. All right. The following about how many fossils are in total, and I want to know if they're like safe in the wild. Oh. So the question was how many, how many fusas in the wild? Mm -hmm. We, we saw the picture of the animal called the fossa, I guess. Yes. It's a really interesting animal. Can you tell us more about that animal? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So when you think of jungles, um, you normally think of like a big predator, right? I mean, in in the plains of, of East Africa, you have lions. Um, in the Amazon, you've got uh, jaguars in the rainforest. Um, and so in Madagascar, you have... Fusa, which are not cats, even though they look just like cats. They're actually a type of mongoose. Um, so a sort of ferret-like thing, um, but they're pretty big. They are the top predator in the ecosystem. So they are the ones who are going to be hunting and eating lemurs in the trees. They're very good at living in the trees. Um, and uh, I've never seen one, but Again, it's it's really up there on my on my you know my bucket list for Madagascar. So um, yeah, they are really. I mean, and they just look so cool. I mean, they look like cats, but they are not. They're about the size of a German Shepherd, um, and it's it's really impressive to think how they can just totally you know chase and hunt down a lemur up in the trees. Actually, I was camped out in Ran Mofan. Um, in that national park in 2017. And while I was laying there in my tent at night, um, I heard alarm calls um, that were being sounded off by lemurs. And I heard what I am nearly certain was a fusa chase. Mm. Um, and it was all just happening over my head up in the canopy. So that was really exciting. That is really but exciting. I didn't see it. <laughs> Because this is the dream, not only to see it, I don't think it's ever been filmed, and I don't know if it ever could be filmed really properly, because it would be like a three-dimensional chase with leaping things, with jumping things, in yeah. a wide array of canopy where you couldn't get the shot, but it would be one of the coolest hunts to witness in all of nature. 
For so, sure. Yeah. I'm so glad someone mentioned the Pooja. They're so cool. So thanks, Mr. Yeah. Kids. Um, we're going to wrap up with one more Miss Wendy Shoes group. Uh, unmute your mics. Come on in. And thank you all so much for being here. Uh, I'll just do a quick note. This will be on YouTube. I'll follow up with some cool survey stuff for all our classes in a minute as well. And do check out our If Then series as part of our whole epic month to wrap up this incredible February as well. Miss Wang's do come on in and take us away. Are there different types of leeches and what eats them? Yes, there are so many different types of leeches. And actually, I do have a slide dedicated to just leeches, if I can find it quickly enough. Um, so there are about 600 different species of leech. They are found all over the world. They're found on every continent except Antarctica. And they are found um, in every ocean and in every sea. And here we are. I wanted to play. Can you see this screen? All right. We sure can. Okay. It's, it's really freaky. I love it. Yeah. So everything you see here is a leech. Um, so they come in all different shapes and sizes and colors. Some have frills, some swim, some are found on land. Um, they almost always have these really intricate patterns. Um, and, uh, and I guess you, you could often find them, um, they'll be eaten by things like frogs and birds um, and uh, I don't know, other, other things that are living out um, and, and feeding on, on small wormy things. So frogs and birds, I think, are the main candidates that are going to be feeding on, um, on leeches. Very cool. May, I know we could talk all day about the amazing work that you've done and these incredible places you've had the chance to visit. Is there any final message on the work that you do that you'd like to share with kids to wrap up with? Anything about Madagascar, leeches, whatever your fancy before we bring in the classes to say farewell? Yeah, I mean, I always just like to emphasize that if this is something that you want to do, um, you can. <laughs> Anyone can. Um, if you love science and if you love research, um, you know, tell your teachers and, and see how you might be able to get involved in doing research at home. If you want to work with animals, you don't have to go all the way to Madagascar to do so. Um, you know, there's wildlife everywhere. There are big questions to ask all the time in every ecosystem. Um, so don't don't feel like this is, you know, sort of an impossible option if if you want to to get out there and, and see cool things and do research in that way. Um, otherwise, I mean, don't be afraid of things that look different and slimy and small. So stay curious and um, and form your own opinions and question um, everything. Amazing. <laughs> May, thank you so much for this. Uh, your enthusiasm is palpable and it's uh, such a cool place you have the opportunity to share with us today. So I'm going to bring in our class in Mr. Kant's class, Ms. Swangshu's class. Our Hamilton crew had to leave a little early, but a big thank you to them for joining as well and YouTubers. Uh, come on in, everyone. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful day, kids. Bye for now, guys. Bye.